Hello, I'm Suzette Field of A Curious Invitation. Welcome to the 32 Londoners podcast series. Along with Stephen Coates of Antique Beat, on May the 1st, I curated an extraordinary event on the EDF energy, London Eye. For one rotation, each of the eye's 32 capsules was occupied by a speaker giving a talk about one of 32 significant born Londoners to a small audience. Here is David Stafford on the songwriter Lionel Bart. Okay, well, Lionel Bart, the composer of Oliver Living Doll, uh, From Russia with Love, and a thousand other hits, was born in Mother Levy's Jewish maternity home, which was that way in the east end of London. He was the seventh child and the last child of Morris and Yetta Begleiter. Uh, Dad was a tailor. Uh, This is in the old days when the the, the East End was almost exclusively Jewish. It was a very, very Jewish area, just as later on it became a very South Asian area. And now it's become a place where, you know, people trade Otto Lenghi recipes and push strollers with big wheels on them. Uh, But then it was a very, very exclusively Jewish area. And Morris was a tailor. Uh, He had a sweatshop down the bottom of his garden in a shed uh, where on a good week he turned out 50 ladies' overcoats. But there weren't many good weeks, so the family was poor. But they was poor, but they was noisy. It was an astonishingly noisy household. Everybody who ever went there will tell you. Well, we've got, we've got um, tapes that Lionel made when he first got his first cassette recorder, which was in about 1966, years before anybody else got them. He recorded everything. He just went round. So we've got tapes of his family then. He goes and visits his family, and all they do is scream. And Dad is sitting there in the middle of it all with the racing on the telly on full volume. And in the early days, there was no racing, there was no telly, so they had the, re- the wireless on the whole time. Uh, so he brought up, was brought up in an atmosphere of massive amounts of music everywhere. If you walk down the commercial road, there were several Jewish theatres down there. All the pubs had sing-songs in them. He was going to Petticoat Lane Market, where there were street singers and things like that. He was surrounded by music everywhere he went. He absorbed precious little of it at the time, though. His musical education was almost non-existent. At one point, his dad, thinking he'd make some money if his lad was a boy genius violinist like a hoodie menu, brought him a 30-bob violin at Petticoat Lake Market and signed him up for some um, violin lessons. But he didn't do very well. And his mom called it the Wailing Cat and was very glad when she was able to consign it to the dustbin. Uh, He was good as a lyricist, though. And he used to make himself very popular at school by making up dirty words to the songs of the day. Apparently his version of Red Sails in the Sunset, which he made up in the school playground, somebody said that it could strip the leather off a docker's boots. He he mastered obscenity at a very, very early age. And he used to swap goes on roller skates. He could never afford a pair of roller skates, but he had friends who could. So he would sing them a dirty song and they would uh, give him a go on their roller skates, which is a fair trade, it's a living. The war came and he was evacuated at one point to Wales and there he encountered his first piano. Sadly, he never learned to play it, but he did manage to pick out tunes with one finger. That was the end of his musical education. He never learned to read music, he never learned to write down music, he never learned proper harmony, he never knew anything. Um, When he was in an improbably young age, something like 13, 14, 15, he got a scholarship at St. Martin's School of Art. And I can point to something now. Where's the Charing Cross Road? That's that's where the Charing Cross Road is. The the St. Martin's School of Art in those days, well, until quite recently, I think it still is actually, was on the Charing Cross Road. And this brought him up west. Up west was a foreign country to people from, from, from the east, from the east end. And he discovered the sins and terrors and delights of Soho which is just behind St. Martin's School of Art, which was to become his manor, but that's a little bit later in the story. After the war, conscription took him into the RAF and he had to go to a place called Padgate, which is about 200 miles that way, I think. It's near Warrington, and you know, Liverpool sort of way. Um, he, the great thing that he got from the RAF was a friend. 
On his way up to Padgate on the train, there was another bloke who was also going to Padgate to join the RAF, whose name was John Gorman. And Lionel and John made friends then and remained very, very close friends until John's death a, a long, long time later. He died just before Lionel, didn't he? Um, they, line, thanks to Lionel, they had a very nice cushy time in the RAF while other people were, were you know, shooting people and learning to fly aeroplanes. He and John Gorman ran the stationery stores and bunked off the whole time. They used to go into town and say, we've got to go and get some more pens. And they go into town and go to the pictures. And one day, here we go, one day, this is from the, the biopic, one day they went to see a film which was David Lean's film of Oliver Twist. Uh, with Anthony Newley, Alec Guinness, John Howard Davis, uh, who else was in it? Robert Newton as Bill Sykes. Um, and when Lionel came out, and John Gorman swore that this is true, it's in John Gorman's little book that he wrote, uh, John Gorman said, Lionel turned to him and said, one day I am going to write a musical based on that film and it will be better than any American musical. Believe it if you will. Um, after the RAF, he, uh, by this time he'd also become a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, mostly through John Gorman, who was a card-carrying communist. And so he started hanging out at Unity Theatre, which was in, I'm going to point somewhere, which is there. I can see the post office tower, so it's sort of that way ish. Uh, Unity Theatre, which was in Goldington Street, sort of St Pancras area, which was an old Methodist chapel that had been converted into a theatre. And it was a, a left-wing theatre company. Um, and an awful lot of people who became big stars of, of, of the British stage served their apprenticeship at... Uh, sorry, I'm looking because what I'm trying to do, and I think I've already failed. No, I haven't. I'm trying to time the climax of his career to when we're at the top and then his downfall when we're going over the other side. We're doing quite well at the moment. At the Unity Theatre, he first started off painting scenery because he'd had that art training. And, uh, but then he started writing songs and sketches and he got better at it and his songs and sketches sort of started be to become a bit popular. So he thought, I can do this. So he wrote a song and he sent it up to the wireless, which is what you did. And he sold it to Billy Cotton for 25 guineas. And that was his very first song. And it was called Oh for a Cup of Tea. The joke of the song was that coffee was drowning Soho at this time. Coffee was the big bohemian drink at the time. It was the replacement for all that tea that had seen us through the war and was associated with war and austerity and all that. Coffee was a continental drink. It was a bohemian drink. It was a left-wing drink. It was a communist drink. It was an anarchist drink. It was a, the drink of prostitutes and pimps and all those awful people who hung around Soho who Lionel was unmistakably attracted to. What did he do with his 25 quid that he got from Billy Cotton? He threw a party. Where did he throw the party? At a place called the Yellow Door, which was just over there, I think. Just behind where the old Vic Theatre is now. There was a bomb site, and it was called the Yellow Door. It was a squat where a lot of bohemians and people like that. And it was called the Yellow Door because that was practically all of the house that was left. In fact, it was practically all of the street that was left. The street was just a bomb site in bricks. So they lit a big fire outside and had a lovely party. The presiding genius of the Le Yellow Door was a man called Mike Pratt, who was a bit of a guitar player and a layabout. Uh, one of the guests at the party was a young merchant seaman and another guitar player called Tommy Hicks. Lionel, Tommy Hicks and Mike Pratt formed a skiffle group. If you don't know what skiffle group is, if you don't know what skiffle group is, ask your granddads. They formed a skiffle group called the Cavemen and they used to play. They were crap, they were absolute rubbish, but they played here and there. Tommy there was a good singer, Tommy Hicks was. And he got a gig of his own at the Two Eyes Coffee Bar, which was the key coffee bar in Soho. Uh, the Two Eyes on Old Compton Street was the cradle of British rock and pop. Everybody started at the Two Eyes. Cliff Richard started there. Um, name some people who started at the Two Eyes. The Vipers started there. Lots of people started there. The Shadows started there. Lots, Adam Faith started there. Lots of people started their careers at the Two Eyes. And Lionel had painted the murals on the walls at, at the Two Eyes. Anyway, Tommy got a gig at the Two Eyes. This is Tommy Hicks. Are we near the top? No, we're getting there. Scream if you want to go faster, by the way. Uh, Tommy got a gig uh, at the Two Eyes, was spotted 
by a, a press photographer called John Kennedy, who decided, he said, can I manage you? And Tommy said, what do you know about management? And John Kennedy did he said, John Kennedy said, what do you know about singing? And a relationship was formed. Um, John Kennedy brought in another man to help manage Tommy called Larry Palms, who became the, and it, he managed, go on, we can name them. Well, he managed Billy Fury, Georgie Fame, Joe Brown, Duffy Power, Marty Wilde. He had this stable of rock stars. He ran the lot of them. Uh, and that was Larry Palms. And his first find was Tommy Hicks. Changed Tommy Hicks's name, like he changed everybody's name, to Tommy Steele. Uh, got him a record contract. They went down Decker on Bronsbury Avenue in West Hampstead, which is over there, and um, recorded a song, recorded one of the joke songs that he'd done for the, for the Skiffle group called Rock With The Caveman. It was not a massive hit. It made number 13, though. And it was also the very, very, very first record. This is why it's so historically important. It was the very, very first record that I ever bought. Uh, so Rock With The Caveman made Tommy into a star. And it was a sort of a, a pre-run of Beatlemania. People screamed at Tommy. They tore his clothes off him. Um, he started making films. Uh, they got him signed up. And his first film was called The Tommy Steele Story, which was for a 21-year-old lad isn't bad going. Tommy and um, Lionel and Mike Pratt were hired. I'm trying to get through it because we've got to get there. Uh, Lionel and Mike Pratt were hired to write songs for... Uh, for the film, and they had several hits from that. One was Butterfingers. If you don't remember of these, any of these songs, it's because you won't be dying very soon. Um, <laughs> Butterfingers, Handful of Songs, uh, uh, Water, Water, lots and lots of songs from that film became hits. Lionel was becoming a hit maker. Lionel and Mike Pratt were becoming a hit key songwriting team. But Lionel had never forgotten that his first love, that he made at Unity Theatre was theatre. And he'd written this show called Petticoat Lane uh, and written a lot of songs for it. And after a bit he decided, nah, Petticoat Lane's the wrong. So he ported all those songs to that old idea that he'd had, the, the Oliver Twist idea, and thought he's going to write the song. If we get in there, he, <laughs> he, he thought he'd write uh, the musical about Oliver Twist. So he, he, he moved all these songs across and started using them and made a demo tape and started taking this demo tape around uh, different managements, different agency, but absolutely no luck. And somebody said, why not try the Theatre Royal Stratford-on-Avon? Now, th this was an extraordinary, um, uh, uh, you know, innovative place. They were doing left-wing theatre, they were doing experimental theatre there. Stratford's that way, not Stratford-on-Avon, Stratford where the, the, the um, East. East, that's East, yeah, Stratford East it's called, yeah. Um, Joan Littlewood was a little, she, somebody, Jude Kelly's talking about Joan Littlewood just up there at the moment. She was a little firebrand of British theatre. She reinvented British theatre. Uh, she'd done theatre in lorries in Manchester and she came down and took over this theatre. They did, they had two amazing hits. One was Brendan Behan's The Hostage and the other was Sheila Delaney's A Taste of Honey, both of which tra had transferred to the West End. So Lionel got in there. And he showed Jerry Raffles, who was the other manager, and Joan Littlewood, his songs for uh, the Oliver Twist musical. And they said, no thanks. But uh, they, they got this 16-page script. Not, not even a script, 16 pages written by an ex-convict called Frank Norman. And they said, we want to turn this into a musical. They, got, they decided they'd do it in two weeks. They'd write, rehearse, and polish a musical in two weeks. Lionel wrote the songs for it. The musical was called Things Ain't What They Used To Be. And over this period of rehearsal, they developed this incredible creative energy, creative buzz. And when it opened, that buzz went straight over the footlights and affected the audience. It was the most exciting show that has ever been up to that point. It was about Soho, there, uh, and it was a filthy show. It was about pimps and prostitutes and a gambling den and razor gangs, but it was a comedy. Nothing like it had ever been seen. This is at exactly the same time as the Lady Chatterley trials going on. It's at the time when the Wolfenden Report has come out. The Wolfenden Report, which looked into prostitution and homosexuality, and at the meetings of the Wolfenden Report, they were so coy that they never ever at the meetings mentioned the words homosexual or prostitute. They talked about Huntleys and Palmers. And in all, 
in all of the meetings. So they opened this show. It was a huge success. It transferred to the West End. It gave the first break to a young uh, girl who'd come from the, the, come from the East End, got, gone west and wasn't very keen on going back east again, but they persuaded her and her name was Barbara Windsor and that was her sort of first proper theatre job. Uh, Richard Harris was in it as well at the start of his career, who later became Dumbledore. Um, uh, who else was in it? Lots and lots of stars were in it. We're getting there. Okay, so uh, things ain't what they, I'll, I will read you afterwards if there's time, because things ain't what they used to be. Got in a lot of trouble with the Lord Chamberlain, who was the censor of the time, and that his letters to. Uh, to the, the cast and the, and the crew of, of things like what they used to be are very, very funny, the things that they objected to. Uh, the angle at which the builder holds the plank is too suggestive. Please change the angle of the plank and let us know in future what the angle will be. And they were sort of saying, it'll be 60 degrees. No, no, no. Anyway, so things, he's had a huge hit. He's meanwhile still writing hits. He writes uh, a, 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 another film for Tommy Steele called Tommy the Toreador. Writes a, show, a song for that called Little White Bull. Once upon a time there was a little white bull, which I think is still a children's hit. It was for years and years and years. Made a lot of money out of that song. He did a song for Cliff Rich, a film for Cliff Richard called Serious Charge. For that, he wrote a song called Living Doll. It was Cliff Richard's first number one and Lionel's first number one. He wrote a song called, for Anthony Newley called Do You Mind? It was Anthony Newley's first number one and Lionel's second number one. His, his fortunes were rising. He was getting better and better. And finally, he gets a theatre owner and impresario called Donald Albury to take on his Oliver project. Uh, they get a cast together. They get... They, first of all, they asked Joan Littlewood from Theatre Workshop to, to direct it. She was too busy doing other stuff. So they got a man called Peter Coe. I've missed out a whole musical here, but never mind. Uh, they get a man called Peter Coe to do it. It goes for tryouts. In, they get Ron Moody. They get Georgia Brown. They get the cast together. It goes for tryouts at Wimbledon, which is probably over there somewhere. Yes, in. That way. It's over there. Wimbledon over there. And uh, it's, it's not doing well. Opening night comes at the, what was then called the New Theatre, it later changed its name to the Albury Theatre and now it's the Noel Coward Theatre on St Martin's Lane, which has got to be there somewhere. Uh, Lionel's petrified, he thinks it's a terrible flop. He gets himself an aisle seat so he can leave at the first sign of anything going wrong. About 15 minutes in there's a glitch, one of the bits, one of the set changes doesn't look quite work. Lionel can't stand it. He leaves the theatre. He goes round the corner to the Garrick Theatre where, where things ain't what they used to be is still playing. He goes into Barbara Windsor's dressing room and just sits there worrying, anxious the whole night. When he thinks the curtain must have come down by now, he starts slowly walking back to the new theatre. As he gets nearer, he hears this roar and he says, oh God, they're booing. They hate it so badly. They are actually tearing up the theatre. He, uh, as he gets even closer, he hears them going, awful, awful, awful. But as he gets into the theatre, he realises they're not saying awful, awful. They're saying, author, author. The cast are on about their 15th curtain call. The house is going mad. They drag Lionel on the stage. He makes a little uh, speech. It goes to 27 curtain calls on that opening night. Uh, they reprise, consider yourself, yeah, yeah, over and over again. The audience won't. Eventually, the audience come on stage and join them in the dancing. It is the most successful opening night, probably, in the entire history of British theatre. Uh, and we're at the top. There we are. Um, <laughs> Lionel was absolutely at the peak of his power. He'd got records in the charts. He'd got one, two, three musicals running in the West End. One of them I haven't even had time to mention. Um, uh, he's making money. He starts spending money like mad. He was wearing the smartest suits, Dougie Millings and Robbie Stanford, two, two of the big tailors at the time. He was driving a Fassel Vega and he had a drophead Bentley on the side. Uh, everything about him was, was his friends. Oh, his friends at that time. He, he's one of his best friends and his best friend until she 
died not long after was Judy Garland. She'd come over from America, seen things several times, gone backstage, wanted to be with Lionel the whole time. Uh, Noel Coward had seen things and phoned him up. And uh, the, the story that Noel tells, and I'll tell it in Noel Coward's own words, uh, Noel phoned and says, uh, Hello, is that Lionel Bart? And Lionel said, uh, Yeah, who's this? He said, It's Noel. And he said, Noel who? And says, no coward, you cockney cunt. <laughs> and that, another great friendship. He used to go to Jamaica and see Noel, and he used to go to um, uh, Chili Chalet in, in Switzerland, which was Noel's place there, and see, see Noel. Um, so he was absolutely on top of the world. From about there to about there was his manner. He was king of the hill. He was top of the heap. He was cock of the walk. Uh, he'd never had to book a table at a restaurant. He'd say it's Lionel Bart and you know, people would be killed to make a table for him. Uh, he, 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 he went to parties and everybody knew he was, you know, I mean, he was having a fabulous time. He was an, an A-list celebrity. Joseph Heller, and as we just reach the top and start coming down again, Joseph Heller, the bad start bit starts now. Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch-22, uh, I don't know if you've read that book, but it's a great book, uh, was asked, uh, he was often asked, why have you never ever read, uh, why have you never ever written anything as good as Catch-22? And Joseph Heller's reply was always, who has? I mean, nobody, uh, Lionel then did two more musicals, two, two you know, fairly successful musicals. If somebody else had done those musicals, they'd have been called successes, they were successful musicals. They were huge. One was called Blitz, and it recreated uh, the Blitz in the, in the East End of London. It was a sort of Romeo and Juliet story set in the East End of London. Uh, but he had a wonderful man who built all his sets called Sean Kenny, who's a big Irishman who thought big, thought huge. And for Blitz, the stage had to be reinforced to take the weight of the set. He had huge things that moved around and fell on people and killed things. And it was, you know, it was always, it was always bigger and better than anything that had seen before. Noel Coward described Blitz as uh, longer and much, much louder than the real thing. Um, <laughs> but it worked. People went. It sold, it sold tickets. Uh, then Oliver went to Broadway and it gets better. People say that the Beatles conquered America in 1964. They didn't. Lionel Bart did it in 1963. When Lionel was, uh, Lionel, it opened at the beginning of 63 on Broadway, uh, Oliver did, and was a huge, huge smash, won five Tony Awards, three Tony Awards, and was nominated for a shed load of other Tony Awards and other awards. Um, uh, there's a great bit there where on February 1964, which was when the show had been running a year. Beyond the Fringe, it was at the same time, another British show was running directly across the road, and just a few blocks away, Tony Neely was doing Stop the World, I Want to Go Off. So there were three hit British shows on Broadway at the time. But on the beginning of February, uh, nine, I think it was February the 9th, 1964, um, the Ed Sullivan Show did a British special. And it started with the Oliver cast singing some of the great hits that everybody knew from Oliver. Then a British star called Tessie O'Shea, who was starring in an old coward play on Broadway at the time. She sang a few songs. And then the highlight of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. And that was when the Beatles took America by storm. That was that first Ed Sullivan show. Uh, Lionel was part of that show. Georgia Brown was part of that show. Oliver was a huge part of that show. The, the British had come. Lionel had discovered, however, um, uh, Mersey Beat long before the Beatles were famous. He'd already was planning a show called Maggie May, uh, which was set in Liverpool, the story of a, a, a Liverpool prostitute and a Liverpool docker, um, uh, which was set, it, it was set in Liverpool, and he'd been up to Liverpool to do recce's and met Brian Epstein up there and been to the cavern and seen the Beatles before they were remotely famous. He also hired a playwright called Alan Owen to write the book of Maggie May. The Beatles stole him halfway through the procedure to go and write Hard Day's Night for them, their first film. So he was in all that Mersey crowd. Maggie May opened an even bigger set. John Junkin, an actor who was in it, said one of the jokes going round the cast at the time was, uh, how's your girlfriend? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, she's not with us anymore. She got eaten by the set. The 
they, they got much bigger. And it was also crippled, that show, was by Rachel Roberts, who played Maggie May, who was uh, a pain in the arse, apparently, and a drinker and a terrible woman to work with. She was also the wife of Rex Harrison. And this prompted a nice line from Tony Newley when Tony Newley was doing uh, Dr. Doolittle, a film with Rex Harrison. And Tony Newley's line was, I don't know if Rex can talk to the animals, but he's certainly married to one. He said. Uh, they got rid of Rachel in the end and got, uh, got Georgia Brown into the show, which is what Lionel always wanted. So he'd had these two hits. Then he bought the house uh, on Spencer Walk, uh, Seymour Walk rather, in Chelsea. Chelsea there, somewhere. Right, uh, yeah, right over there, right out. Right out. Seymour Walk, Chelsea, he, he built, well, he didn't build it, he converted a house. He bought the house for £55,000 and converted it for £110,000. This was in 1965. We are talking millions and millions and millions of pounds now, but he had it. Uh, it was a Xanadu. If you've seen Citizen Kane, you'll know what Xanadu is. It's a, just a gothic monstrosity with suits of armour. Technology, a cinema screen came down from the Minstrels Gallery. He had a, uh, if you, a secret door in the back of the wardrobe that took him into a, 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 a sauna bath. Uh, he had televisions everywhere. He had every, every room had a microphone and a tape recorder in it. So if he had a musical thought while he was wandering around, he could go, oh, yeah, 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 and walk on again. Um, and it went into immediate party mode. This, one of the stories is that at the door there were two glass bowls. One was full of £10 notes so that guests on their way out could just pick up a bit of cab fare in case they hadn't got any. The other was full of cocaine in case guests who were coming in were a little bit tired and needed something to perk them up. Everybody went to those parties. The, uh, after the 1966 World Cup, where did they party? Lionel's Place. The team were, were there. Uh, you know, Noel Coward, Cassius Clay, Rudolf Nureyev. If you look at his guest list, it's who you know, it's even got Lyndon Johnson in there, but I think that might be a joke. The Rolling Stones and the Beatles were both regulars. Then came the biggest show of all. Are we far enough down yet? Yes. The biggest show of all. He decided he was going to do this massive show based on the Robin Hood legend. And not only that, but he was going to revive that old, that old buzz that he got from things ain't what they used to be. So he got Joan in to, to uh, Joan Littlewood in to direct it. He got Oliver Messel, who was a re relative of the Queen. He was the uncle of Anthony Armstrong Jones or something. To, and was a big, very posh interior designer and stage designer. He got him to do the designs. He got Paddy Stone, who was a very strict disciplinarian dancer, in to um, do the choreography. Oliver Messel, Paddy Stone, Joan Littlewood, Lionel Bart were all people who were used to getting their own way. Putting them together was absolute poison. Putting drugs into that mix, uh, Lionel was doing quite a lot of acid at this time, made it even worse. Putting Joan Littlewood, who was a terrible anarchist, you know, anywhere near something like this, it's a West End show with a lot of money going into it, war, we're going to have some fun. She took the cast, well Lionel took the cast, to the Fun Palace, to his house on Seymour Walk for three months of improvisation and let's just work it up, see how, they, see how it goes. At the end of three months they hadn't got anything, they hadn't got a script. Uh, Oliver Messel meanwhile had designed some costumes, they arrived, Joan Littlewood said they're too posh, turn them all inside out. Uh, it was a mess from start to finish. It opened in Manchester, it hadn't got a second half. It just fell apart in the second half. The actors didn't know what they were doing. They were writing new lines on the backs of bits of scenery and, you know, they were all over the place. Terrified, the actors were. It got terrible, terrible, terrible reviews. But Lionel insisted that it was going to happen. Joan Littlewood walked. Bernard Delfont, who'd put up most of the money, walked. Uh, Lionel then, this is one of his huge mistakes, he sold 10 years of all his publishing rights to United Artists uh, in order to raise the money to finance the show. He, put his, he did what, exactly what Noel Coward told him never to do, back a show with your own money. Uh, he insisted it was going to open. It opened at the Shaftesbury Theatre on Shaftesbury and, you know, and, um, uh, and flopped. Nobody came. I mean, they booed. Uh, they, they, they did this time practically tear the theatre apart. Uh, it had dreadful reviews in the press, but Lionel insisted it was going to stay open, so he kept it open with his own money. He was just pouring money, paying these wages bills. 
anything that he could manage. Uh, it closed a month later, and Lionel was broke in every, in every sense of the word. He was a broken man. Uh, then awful things started to happen to him. Uh, a series of people died. First of all, Alma Cogan, who was a big star of the 1950s and was another of Lionel's very, very close friends. Shortly after Twang closed, Alma died of cancer. She was only in her 30s. Uh, not long after that, a couple of years or so later, Judy Garland, another of his close friends, committed suicide. He went to America to work for United Artists to write some films. He didn't do a stroke of work. He drove around and took the piss, basically. He took their money, but you know, just spent it all on parties again. Came back to England and lapsed into alcoholism. And he had 15 glorious lost years. Uh, and they were just marked by this string of ever such awful deaths. Uh, Yetta, his mother, died. Sean Kenny, his best friend who, who designed all his sets, died again at an impossibly young age. Um, his dad died. Uh, several other people died. And, and he turned to the bottle. I mean, uh, and he, drank. he had a wonderful time drinking. Uh, he ended up drinking uh, the, the worst possible thing that, I mean, I think doctors talk about it now. The worst state of alcoholism that you could get in in the 1970s was to go drinking with Keith Moon and Oliver Reed. Lionel used to go drinking with Keith Moon and Oliver Reed. That's the worst alcoholism can possibly get. He was saved, though, by his old friend John Gorman. Do you remember John Gorman, who he first met in the RAF? It was him. Came along like a knight in shining armour and with a couple of other people, did a sort of intervention and got Lionel into, into, into a clinic. The, Lionel then clinic hopped. Lionel <laughs> then clinic, clinic hopped for a long time. Joined the AA, gradually got well again. Didn't do very much in the way of work uh, and was still very sick. He'd, he'd lost a lot of his liver function and you know all that terrible stuff that happens to alcoholics. But he vaguely got some of his money sorted out. He'd, he'd given away all of his copyrights. He didn't own any of Oliver. There were several revivals of Oliver in the 1970s and 80s. Lionel didn't make a penny out of any of them. He'd, he'd been in a bar and he needed another fiver for a drink. So here, yeah, you can have living doll buy us a drink. Uh, it had all gone. It had all frittered away. When people try and do some of his more obscure shows later, what they discovered, uh, the, the Chichester Theatre was going to do a revival of Maggie May at one point, but they looked into it and the copyright. Thousands of people were just coming forward. I own a piece of that and it was just impossible to sort out the copyright problems. Uh, he gets sick. He buys a flat in Acton, a little flat above a, 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 a butcher's shop, wasn't it? Next door to an off-license, strangely. But hires a wonderful woman called Brenda Evans, who becomes his secretary and, and his housekeeper and his cook and looks after him. Um, then some good things started happening. First of all, he did a little advert for Abbey National. I don't know if anybody remembers that. A -da -ba -da -ba -da which was Lionel sitting at a little piano with little round glasses and a pork pie hat. And everybody went, oh, look, it's Lionel Bart, remember him? And he had kids dressing up all around him. Little black and white advert, it was really sweet. And he did a record uh, from, that, from the, the, that jingle called Happy Endings, which just about charted. Uh, the Young Ones, do you remember The Young Ones, the comedy series? They did a, um, uh, a what do you call it, comic relief record of uh, Living Doll which went to the top of the chart. So he had a number one again after all that time. He didn't get paid for it because it was a charity record and I think he'd given away the rights anyway. But it was nice. Then the great one came in 1993 when Sir Cameron Mackintosh, speak his name with awe and majesty, Sir Cameron Mackintosh, the man who runs all the theatres from there, all the way across to there, uh, decided he was going to do a big revival of, of Oliver, do a big... Uh, Version. He hired the 23-year-old Sam Mendes, who later became director of American Beauty and Skyfall. He's now director of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which is running somewhere in the West End, um, to direct it. Uh, the 23-year-old Sam Mendes came in. Lionel took one look at it and said, here, boy, here's a quid. Go and get us a sandwich, will you? That's <laughs> the way Lionel behaved. But the great thing was that uh, Sir Cameron arranged for Lionel to get some of his royalties back. So he, he was part of the show, he was making money out of it, and he was making money again. But he'd had a big heart attack, he'd been in hospital for a long time, he was a sick man. In 1998, 
he got liver cancer and in April 1999 he died. And I'm just going to read, I cry at this point because we, we wrote the, his biography and we, we met a lot of people who knew him. And I got very, very fond of Lionel. I never met him myself, but this is the point. I'll read you a bit and I'll cry. And then we, we might just have time for questions, will we? I don't know. Hang on. Here it is. Oliver has the power in a frozen school hall smelling of sick and dettol to generate an unnerving camaraderie in the audience. When a cast of uncoordinated year nines and tens come out for their curtain calls and tunelessly mumble, consider yourself one more time, that opening night is recreated every single time. The most churlish, the most curmudgeonly audience members find themselves mysteriously compelled to get up on their feet, start clapping and start singing along. Consider yourself that miraculous joy is the legacy of Lionel Barr. Thank you. <laughs> right, has anybody... I think we've got some. Has anybody got any questions? Hi, go on then. What, what about his personal life? His personal life... He was, he, was, he was gay when it was illegal to be gay. He was also one of the first people ever to come out. It was made legal in, just about, made legal in 1967. In 1971, he told the, gay, the Daily Mirror, I am a communist homosexual junkie. That, was, that meant he came out 11 years before Ian McKellen, for example. 14 years, I think, before even... Uh, no, no. The, you know, he, he, he led the vanguard in people coming out. He, he was, was gay and proud of it. He had a very troubled personal life, though. His heart was broken in by a man called Alex Most, otherwise known as Alex Wharton and Alex Murray. Was I supposed to say that? Are people supposed to know that? In, in the late 50s, uh, he fell in love with this bloke, and it was a, a, a sort of fairly short-lived blood of affair. People say that as long as he needs me was written about Alex Most. And uh, where is love? He wrote that in Spain uh, when he was on holiday with Alex Most, and they were having a particularly bad time. But I, I, think, I think, you know, anybody who was gay in the 1950s was, you know, their courage is just unbelievable. I mean, they, they you know, he, him and Noel Coward, Noel Coward taught him a lot about how to be gay, how, to, how, how you could manage it. And Noel Coward managed it brilliantly. Uh, you know, I mean, even towards the end of his life. I think, I can't remember, somebody said to him, uh, have you ever thought of actually coming out? She said, no, I think there might be a little old lady in Worthing who doesn't know yet. <laughs> Thanks for listening. 32 Londoners was sponsored by Hendrix Gin, who created 32 unique cocktails, one for each capsule and one for each London borough. To hear more talks and for more information on 32 Londoners, go to 32londoners.com. Or for more information on Antique Beat and a curious invitation and the other events we create, go to www.antiquebeat.co.uk or a curious invitation.com.